Welcome to the Thousand Nights and One Night. Now, when it was the 598th night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the son of the Persian king, after disguising himself as an old man, shot in years, and taking a seat in the garden, spread out somewhat of the jewels and ornaments before him, and made a show of shaking and trembling, as if for decrepit and the weakness of extreme senility. After an hour or so, a company of damsels and eunuchs entered with the princess in their midst, as she were the moon among the stars, and dispersed about the garden, plucking the fruits and diverting herself. Presently they espied a man sitting under one of the trees, and making towards him, who was the prince, found him a very old man, whose hands and feet trembled for decrepitude, and before him store of precious jewels and royal ornaments. So they marveled at his case, and asked him what he did there with the jewels. When he answered, With these trinkets, I would fain buy me a wife, one of you. They laughed together at him, and said, If one of us marry thee, what wilt thou do with her? Said he, I will give her one kiss, and divorce her. Then quoth the princess, I give thee this damsel to wife. So he rose, and coming up to her, leaning on a staff, and shivering and staggering, kissed her, and gave her the jewels and ornaments, whereat she rejoiced, and they, laughing at him, went their way. Next day they came again to the garden, and finding him seated in the same place with more jewels and ornaments than before him in front of him, asked him, O oh, Sheikh, what wilt thou do with this jewelry? And he answered, saying, I wish therewith to take one of you to wife, even as yesterday. So the princess said, I marry thee to this damsel. And he came up to her, and kissed her, and gave her the jewels, and they all went away. But seeing such generosity to her handmaids, the princess said in herself, I have more right to all these fine things than these baggages, and no harm can betide me. So when morning morrowed, she went down from her chamber, singing into the garden, in the habit one of her damsels, and presenting herself privily before the prince said to him, O oh, Sheikh, the king's daughter hath sent me to thee that thou mayest marry me. He looked at her and knew her, so he answered, with love and gladness, and gave her the jewels and ornaments of the finest and costliest. Then he rose to kiss her, and she off her guard, and fearing nothing, but when he came up to her, he suddenly laid hold of her with a strong hand, and instantly throwing her down on the ground, abated her maidenhead. Then he pulled the beard from his face, and said to her, Dost thou not know me? Asked she, Who art thou? And he answered, I am Biram, the king's son of Persia, who have changed my favor, and am become a stranger to my people and estate for thy sake, and have lavished my treasures for thy love. So she rose from under him in silence, and answered not his address, nor spake a word of reply to him, being dazed for what had befallen her, and seeing nothing better than to be silent for fear of shame. And she bethought herself, and said, if I kill myself, it will be useless, and if I do him die, his death will profit me not. And presently added, Nothing will serve me but that I elope with him to his country. Then she gathered together her monies and treasures, and sent to him, acquainting him therewith, to the intent that he also might equip himself with his wealth and needs. And they agreed upon a night on which to part. So at the appointed time they mounted racehorses, and set out under cover of the gloom nor did morning morrow, till they had traversed a great distance, and they ceased not faring forwards, till they drew near his father's capital in the land of the Persians. When the king heard of his son's coming, he rode out to meet him with his troops, and rejoiced in him with exceeding joy. Then after a few days, he sent the princess's father a splendid present, and a letter to the effect that his daughter was with him, and demanding her wedding equipage. Al Datma's father came out to meet the messengers with great gladness, for that he had deemed his daughter lost and had grieved sore for her loss. After which he made bride feasts and summoning the kazi and the witnesses, let draw up the marriage contract between his daughter and the prince of Persia. He invested the envoys with robes of honor. Then he made ready her equipage and dispatched it to her, and Pat Spiram abode with her till death sundered their union. See, therefore, O king, continued the favorite, the malice of men and their dealing with women. As for me, I will not go back from my due till I die. So the king once more commanded to put his son to death. 
But the seventh wazir came into him and kissing the ground before him said, O king, have patience with me whilst I speak these words of good counsel to thee. How many patient and slow moving men unto their hope attain, and how many who are precipitous fall into shameful state. Now I have seen how this damsel, damsel hath prolifically excited the king by lies to horrible and unnatural cruelties. But I, his Mameluke, whom he hath overwhelmed with his favors and bounties, do proffer him true and loyal reed, for that I know, O king, that know of the malice of women, that which none knoweth save myself, and in particular, there hath reached me on this subject the story of an old woman and the son of the merchant without its warning instances. Ask the king, and what befell out between them, O wazir? And the seventh wazir answered, I have heard tell, O king, of the tale of the house with the Belvedere. A wealthy merchant had a son who was very dear to him, and who said to him one day, O my father, I have a boon to beg of thee, quoth the merchant. O my son, what is it that I may give it to thee, and bring thee to thy desire, though it were the light of my eyes, quoth the youth. Give me money, that I may journey with the merchants to the city of Baghdad, and see its sights, and sail on the Tigris, and look upon the palace of the caliphs. For the sons of the merchants have described these things to me, and I long to see them for myself, said the father. O my son, O my little son, how can I endure to part from thee? But the youth replied, I have said my say, and there is no help for it, but I journey to Baghdad with thy consent, or e'en without it. Such a longing for its sight hath fallen upon me, as can only be assessed by going thither. And Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say. Now, when it was the five hundred and ninety-ninth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the merchant's son said to his sire, There is no help for it but that I journey to Baghdad. Now, when the father saw that there was no help for it, he provided his son with goods to the value of thirty thousand gold pieces, and sent him with certain merchants in whom he trusted, committing him to their charge. Then he took leave of the youth who journeyed with his friends, the merchants, till they reached Baghdad, the house of peace, where he entered the market and hired him a house, so handsome and delectable and spacious and elegant, that on seeing it he well nigh lost his wits for admiration. Further in were pavilions facing one another with floors of colored marbles and ceilings inlaid with gold and lapis lazuli, and its gardens were full of warbling birds. So he asked the doorkeeper what was its monthly rent, and he replied, Ten dinars. Quoth the young porter, the young man, Speakest thou soothly, or dost thou jest with me? Quoth the porter, By Allah, I speak not but the truth, for none who taketh up this abode in this house lodgeth in it more than a week or two. And how is that? Quoth the youth, and quoth the porter, O my son, whoso dwelleth in the house cometh not forth, of it except sick or dead, wherefore it is known amongst all the folk of Baghdad, so that none offereth to inhabit it, and thus cometh it that its rent is fallen so low. Hearing this, the young merchant marveled with exceeding marvel, and said, Needs must there be some reason for this sickening and perishing. However, after considering a while, and seeking refuge with Allah from Satan the stone, he rented the house, and took up his abode there. Then he put away apprehensions from his thoughts, and busied himself with selling and buying, and some days passed by which any such ill case befalling him in the house, as the doorkeeper had mentioned. One day, as he sat upon the bench before his door, there came up a grizzled crone, as she were a snake, speckled white and black, calling aloud on the name of Allah, magnifying him inordinately, and at the same time putting away the stones and other obstacles from the path. Seeing the youth sitting there, she looked at him and marveled at his case, whereupon quoth he to her, O woman, dost thou know me, or am I like any thou knowest? When she heard him speak, she toddled up to him, and saluting him, with the slum asked, How long hast thou dwelt in this house? answered he, Two months, O my mother, and she said, It was hereat I marveled, for I, O my son, know thee not, neither dost thou know me, 
nor yet art thou like any other I know, but I marvel for that none other than thou hath taken up this abode in this house, but hath gone forth from it dead, or dying, save thee. Doubtless, O my son, thou hast periled thy young years, but I, I suppose thou hast not gone up to thy upper story, neither looked out from the belvedere there. So saying, she went her way, and he fell a-pondering her words, and said to himself, I have not gone up to the top of the house, nor did I know that there was a belvedere there. Then he arose forthright, and going in, searched by the byways of the house till he espied in a wall corner among the trees a narrow door, between whose posts the spider had woven her webs, and said to himself, Hmm, happily, the spider hath not webbed over the door, but because death and doom is within. However, he heartened himself with the saying of God the Most High, saying, Nothing shall befall us but what Allah hath written for us. And opening the door, ascended a narrow flight of stairs, till he came to the terrace roof, where he found a belvedere, in which he sat down to rest and solace himself with a view. Presently he caught sight of a fine house, and a well-cared-for hard by, surmounted by a lofty belvedere overlooking the whole of Baghdad, in which sat a damsel, fair as a hoary. Her beauty took possession of his whole heart, and made away with his reason, bequeathing to him the pains and patience of Job, and the grief and weeping of Jacob. And as he sat, looked at her, and considered her curiously, an object to enamour, an aesthetic, and make a devotee, lovesick fire was lighted in his vitals, and he cried, Folk say that whoso taketh up this abode in this house dieth or sickeneth. As this be so, yon damsel is assuredly the cause. Would heaven I knew how I shall win free this affair, for my wits are clean gone. Then he descended from the terrace, pondering his case, and he sat down in the house. But being unable to rest, he went out and took his seat at the door, absorbed in melancholy, thought when, behold, up came the old woman afoot, praising and magnifying Allah as she went. When he saw her, he rose and accosting her with a courteous salam and wishes for her life being prolonged, said to her, O oh, my mother, I was healthy and hearty till thou madest mention to me of the door leading to the belvedere. So I opened it, and ascending the top of the house, saw thence what stole away my sense, as and now bethinks I am a lost man, and I know no physician for me but thyself. When she heard this, she laughed and said, no harm shall befall thee, inshallah, so Allah please. Whereupon he rose and went into the house, and coming back with an hundred dinars in his sleeve, said to her, Take this, O my mother, and deal with me the dealing of lords and slaves, and succor me quickly, for if I die a claim for my blood, will meet thee on the day of doom. Answered she, With love and gladness, but O my son, I expect thou wend me thine aid in some small matter, whereby hangs the winning of thy wish. Quoth he, What wouldst thou have me do, O my mother? Quoth she, Go to the silk market, inquire for the shop of Abu Afath bin Kadam. Sit down thee on his counter, and salute him, and say to him, Give me the face veil thou hast by thee, offrayed with gold, for he hath none handsomer in his shop. Then buy it of him, O my son, at his own price, however high, and keep it till I come to thee to-morrow, Allah Almighty willing. So saying, she went away, and he passed the night upon live coals of the Gaza wood. Next morning he took thousand ducats in his pocket, and repairing to the silk market, sought out the shop of Abu Althath, to whom he was directed by one of the merchants. He found him a man of dignified aspect, surrounded by pages, eunuchs, and attendants, for he was a merchant of great wealth, and consideration befriended by the caliph, and of the blessings which Allah the Most High had bestowed upon him with his damsel, who had ravished the young man's heart. She was his wife, and he not her match for beauty, nor was her like to be found with any of the sons of the kings. The young man saluted him, and Abu Afath returned to Salam and bade him be seated. So he sat down by him and said to him, O merchant, I wish to look at such a face veil. Accordingly, he bade his sleeve bring him a bundle of silk from the inner shop, and opening it, found out a number of veils, whose beauty amazed the youth. Among them was the veil he sought, so he bought it for fifty gold pieces, and bore it home well pleased. And Shahrazad 
perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased to say her permitted say. Now, when it was the six hundredth night, she said, It hath reached me, O auspicious king, that the youth, after buying the veil of the merchant, bore it home, but hardly had he reached the house when, lo, up came the old woman. He rose to her and gave her his purchase when she bade him bring a live coal with which she burnt one of the corners of the veil, then folded it up as before, and repairing to Abu Afat's house, knocked at the door, asked the damsel, who is there? And she answered, I, such an one. Now the damsel knew her for a friend of her mother, so when she heard her voice, she came out and opening the door to her said, What brought thee here, O my mother? My mamma hath left me and gone to her own house. Replied the old woman, O my daughter, I know thy mother is not with thee, for I have been with her in her home, and I come not to thee, but because I fear to pass the hour of prayer. Wherefore I desire to make why wazu Ablution with thee, for I know that thou art clean and thy house pure. The damsel admitted the old trot, who saluted her, and called down blessings upon her. Then she went to the ewer and went into the wash house, where she made her ablutions and prayed in a place there. Presently she came out again and said to the damsel, O my daughter, I suspect thy handmaids have been in yonder place and defiled it, so do thou show me another place where I may pray for thy prayer. I have prayed I account null and void. Thereupon the damsel took her by the hand and said to her, O my mother, come and pray on my carpet where my husband sits. So she stood there and prayed and worshipped, bowed and prostrated, and presently she took the damsel unawares and made shift to slip the veil under the cushion unseen of her. Then she blessed her and went her way. Now as the day was closed, Abu Afath came home and sat down upon the carpet, whilst his wife brought him food, and he ate of it sufficiently, washed his hands, after which he leaned back upon the cushion. Presently he caught sight of a corner of the veil protruding from under the cushion, so he pulled it out and considered it straightly. When knowing it for what he had sold to the young man, he at once suspected his wife of unchastity. Therefore he called her and said, Whence hast thou this veil? And she swore an oath to him, saying, None hath come to me but thou. The merchant was silent for fear of scandal, and said to him, If I open up this chapter, I shall be put to chain before all Baghdad, for he was one of the intimates of the caliph, and so he could not do anything save hold his peace. So he asked no questions, but said to his wife, Whose name was Maziah? It hath reached me that thy mother lieth ill of heartache, and all the women are with her, weeping over her, wherefore I order thee to go to her. Accordingly, she repaired to her mother's house, and found her in the best of health. And she asked her daughter, What brings thee here at this hour? So she told her what her husband had said, and sat with her a while, when, behold, up came porters, who brought her clothes from her husband's house, and transporting all her paraphernalia, and what not else belonged to her of goods and vessels, deposited them in her mother's lodging. When the mother saw this, she said to her daughter, Tell me. What hath passed between thee and thy husband to bring about this? But she swore to her that she knew not the cause thereof, and that there had befallen nothing between them to call for this conduct. Quoth her mother, Needs must there be a cause for this. And she answered, saying, I, I, I know of none, and after this with Almighty Allah be it make provision. Whereupon her mother fell a-weeping, and lamented her daughter's separation from the like of this man by reason of his sufficiency and fortune and the greatness of his rank and dignity. On this wise things abode some days, after which the cursed, ill-omened old woman, whose name was Miriam the coronist, paid a visit to Mazia in her mother's house, and saluted her cordially, saying, What ails thee, O oh, my daughter, O oh, my darling? Indeed thou hast troubled my mind. Then she went into her mother and said to her, O oh, my sister, what is this business about thy daughter and her husband? It hath reached me that he hath divorced her. What hath she done to call for this? Quoth the mother, Be like her husband will return to her by blessed influence of thy prayers, O Hasvia. So do thou pray for her, O oh, my sister, for thou art a day faster and a night prayer. Then the three fell to talking together, and the old woman said to the damsel, 
O my daughter, grieve not, for if Allah please, I will make peace between thee and thy husband before many days. And she left them, and going to the young merchant, said to him, Get ready a handsome entertainment for us, for I will bring her to thee this very night. So he sprang up and went forth, and provided all that was fitting of meat and drink and so forth, then sat down to await the twain, whilst the old woman returned to the girl's mother and said to her, O oh, my sister, we have a splendid bride feast tonight, so let thy daughter go with me that she may divert herself and make merry with us and throw off her cark and care and forget the ruin of her home. I will bring her back to thee, even as I took her away. The mother dressed her daughter in her finest dress and costliest jewels, and accompanied her to the door, where she commended her to the old woman's charge, saying, Where lest thou let any of Almighty Allah's creature look upon her, for thou knowest her husband's rank with the caliph, and do not tarry, but bring her back to me as soon as possible. The old woman carried the girl to the young man's house, which she entered, thinking it the place where the wedding was to be held. But as soon as she came into the sitting saloon, Shahrazad perceived the dawn of the day, and ceased saying her permitted say, and so do I cease my telling of this tale till it be morrow. <laughs>